Welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Okay, so you go to school, you get a job, you climb the corporate ladder, and eventually you retire. It's the professional model we've all been taught to follow. But here's the thing, a whopping 70% of Americans say they feel disengaged at their jobs. And nine out of 10 Americans say they're willing to take a pay cut to do a more meaningful work. So how can you set yourself up for career joy? Can you make a switch even if you're 20, 30, 40 years into your current profession? And do you have to make financial sacrifices to do what you love? And finally, how can you help college students in your life find the right career path? Well, my guest today has the answers. She's Andrea Koppel, the founder and CEO of Time for Coffee podcast and College to Career Academy. Andrea has been extremely su successful in multiple careers. Says it's never too late to make a career jump, and I'll back her on that, no matter how big a jump. And that for some people, it's one of the best decisions they'll ever make. After a quick break, Andrea and I are going to reveal the secrets to helping your college-age family members find the career they love, professional pivoting, and how switching up your career could lead to a happier, more fulfilling life. So stay tuned. This episode can help you or those college-age kids in your life reach full potential and get paid to do what you or they love. Andrea, it's great to have you on the show and great to see you again. Oh, it's wonderful to see you, Dr. Gundry. Thank you so much for inviting me. So your professional background is, is actually really inspiring. Uh, can you share a bit about your career journey and how you got to where you are now? I think it's a really great story. I would love to. And I'm going to begin the story with when I was in college. I was a political science major who concentrated in Asian studies and Mandarin Chinese. And I studied that because while I was in school, I thought I wanted to become an American diplomat. And then my senior year of college, I took the foreign service exam. I didn't study. I didn't realize you should. <laughs> and I failed the exam. And so there I was in the spring of my senior year, like, well, what the heck am I going to do? And the U.S. Peace Corps came to recruit on campus. And I love adventure. That's why I wanted to go into the Foreign Service. I love living abroad. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty good for a couple of years. And I was accepted to go to Nepal. And then a few months later, after I graduated, a curveball came my way. It wasn't quite like the coronavirus curveball, but it was a curveball that affected me. And I learned some troubling things about what had happened in Nepal. And so I stepped away from the Peace Corps. I decided I wasn't going to do that. And I had no plan B. And out of the blue, a friend of my parents, who usually lived in China, just happened to be in the U.S. And he had just come from New York. And he said, oh, Andrea doesn't have a job. I just met this woman in New York, Virginia Kamsky, and she only hires young women who speak Mandarin Chinese. And she has a job. So I wasn't interested in business, Dr. Gundry, but my parents encouraged me to go and at least interview for the job. And what do you think happened? I got the job. A couple of weeks later, I was on a plane flying to Beijing to do this job working for an American trade and finance firm. <laughs> I didn't like the job, but all of my friends outside of work were journalists. And I heard their stories. And I said, wow, that's what I want to do. So after six months, I quit that job. I flew back to the U.S. I ended up spending 20 years as a journalist. And when I was 43 years old, after I had been a correspondent with CNN 
For 14 years, I'd been a foreign correspondent, a diplomatic correspondent, and I had covered Capitol Hill. The new president of CNN decided I wasn't his cup of tea, and he didn't renew my contract. It was such a blessing in disguise because that forced me to reinvent myself. I decided I didn't want to stay in journalism. I had a three and a half year old son at that time. I didn't have the courage to quit my job with CNN. I had actually been unhappy there because I didn't think there was anything else I could do other than journalism. So once I wasn't with CNN anymore, I met up with all kinds of people to have coffee. I asked them about what they did. I educated myself and I learned that there was a niche in the PR world that works with nonprofits and foundations. And I thought, well, that aligns with my values. I want to be contributing to the greater good. So I ended up getting hired as a senior vice president of communications for this boutique firm. I did that for a couple of years, and then I moved into the nonprofit world, and I stayed in the nonprofit world for seven years. I worked in policy, and then four and a half years ago, in June of 2017, I quit my job to be a full-time stay-at-home mom because My son was then 13 years old, and I wanted to deepen my relationship with him. And it was when I had that radical headspace, the freedom to dream and not be distracted by the nine to five, that I decided I would start this podcast, Time for Coffee, to interview professionals like you. Thank you again for coming on the Time for Coffee podcast in dozens of different industries to learn about what you do in your current job and how you built your career as a way to help college students and young professionals get an insider's perspective on all the opportunities that await them and bring to life Those job descriptions, which are usually one dimension that you read on job boards, excuse me, on job boards and discover what these jobs are really like. And after interviewing hundreds of people, I began to see these patterns that I wasn't hearing career coaches talking about, that I wasn't hearing career counselors that I wasn't hearing within the conventional wisdom of today about how to start a career, about how to build a truly meaningful professional life. And that's how I became a career coach. Huh. Well, so, you know, I certainly uh, agree with everything you've said so far, but most people, um, let's talk about college for now, Things seem to be so regimented, even kind of from the preschool days of, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to get into this high school, you're going to get into this college, and you're going to do this, this, and this, because that's your track, and if you don't start at age five, (laughs) it's over for you. It's, It's almost like training to be a professional tennis player, I guess. Is number one, uh, is that still going on? And number two, how do you interfere with this process? Because clearly that, that system doesn't work. Well, great questions. And I would like to say, let's crumple up the piece of paper <laughs> where that was written and throw it out. Because in this new world that we're living in, this current, whether we call it post-pandemic, current pandemic world, where things are changing so rapidly, the idea that you're going to stay in one career is so unrealistic. And the truth is, let's just talk about when 
young people get into college, the fact is 73% of them change their majors. Why is that? Well, it may be because their parents or their high school counselors told them they should study whatever it was. And then they got into college and they realized, I don't like this. This is, you know, I may be failing certain courses. It doesn't play to my strengths. Or they discover, oh my gosh, there's this field that I didn't even know existed. I want to study that. And that is actually a microcosm for what happens to us when we get into the quote unquote real world. We start somewhere. We do certain tasks. We say, yeah, I like this or no, I don't. And more often than not, unfortunately, people give in to fear and they stay put where they were. They figure, oh, I've already invested three years or five years or 10 years. And they listen to that that uh, the amygdala, right, the fight or flight, and they, and they freeze and they just stay put. And what I try to teach the young people that I work with is that you can start anywhere in your professional life, anywhere. And there is no such thing as making a mistake. I would say in your first, second, third, or even your 15th job. Why is that? Because you're learning. And in fact, Dr. Gundry, I've come up with a bit of a metaphor. And I think it plays to your field, which is rather than thinking of how you build your career, like it's a recipe, you're a chef, you're following, you know, whatever steps one through five, you're getting your ingredients. Let's say you're making lasagna and you have your your ground beef and your ricotta and your maybe your non-dairy ricotta <laughs> <laughs> and, and and maybe it's your plant-based uh, noodle that of course doesn't have any gluten in it and you're making your lasagna you put it in the oven at 375 and there you take it out and there is your perfect career with a crispy crust no it's more like you're a mad scientist. You're in the laboratory. You've got those big plastic goggles on and your Bunsen burner and your test tubes. And you're putting different ingredients in those test tubes. And the reason I say you're a mad scientist is that, you know, sometimes it blows up in your face <laughs> and maybe you took a wrong move. Maybe you went to a company that, you know, had a toxic work environment. And so what are you doing? You're, you're experimenting. You're trying to find the right formula for you because each of us is a unique formula. We're not a recipe. And the only way that we can learn what the right formula is for us, just like that mad scientist, is by experimenting, by testing, by iterating, and by doing. So you have to do, you have to try. And sure, it's scary to push yourself outside your comfort zone, but that is where the richness of our lives is. And I can tell you with every pivot that I made, I suffered from imposter syndrome. I experienced fear, but I also, the more that I stayed in it, the more excited I became because I was learning new skills. Uh, is imposter syndrome the same as fake it until you make it? Absolutely. and. I have learned, Dr. Gundry, from the hundreds of people I've interviewed, and most of them incredibly successful like you, just about everybody experiences imposter syndrome. It's just we don't talk about it. You know, we're not, we're not 
telling our colleagues, you know, I'm really feeling out of my depth here. I'm feeling I, I don't feel so comfortable because this is new to me. We put on our mask, we suck it up and we do it. Yeah, it's funny after after my first book years ago, uh, where I talked about a few people with autoimmune disease going into remission or being cured by following my program, it was almost incidental in the book. Uh, people started showing up in my office saying, uh, what do you know about autoimmune disease? And I go, well, I don't know anything about autoimmune disease, but I know a lot about how the immune system works because I was a transplant immunologist as a surgeon. So I know how to fool the immune system. So if you want to play, uh, you know, no guarantees here because I, I don't know anything about this, but if you want to play, let's play. And now 80% of my practice is autoimmune disease. Uh, so you're right. You, know, you just, but I, I think I learned early on, maybe the same way with you, if you're honest with people and say, look, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm, I'm learning and I want to learn with you, makes a big difference, I think, as you, as you advance in, in a career choice. Absolutely. But I think the reason that you were able to say, look, I'm not an expert in this is because you're a self-confident man. And there are plenty of people out there who are insecure and who don't want to show their cards and admit that they don't know. And so they move forward with the imposter syndrome. And that kind of perpetuates, unfortunately, the narrative for college students and young professionals that they're the only ones who feel that way. So how do you how do you change how do you teach somebody uh, to to not do that or to to embrace the imposter syndrome as they're learning? Well, the first thing that I do is I try to break down the silos in their brains, and what I mean by that is our universities and colleges here in the United States do a pretty good job, let's say sometimes they do a great job of educating our young people in a particular major. But they do a pretty terrible job of helping these young people recognize that they are learning transferable skills. And so most young people graduate self-identifying by their major. I'm a history major, I'm an English major, I'm a natural sciences Mandarin major. Mandarin Chinese major. I'm a Mandarin <laughs> Chinese major. And what I tell them is that you are not going to be forced to live in the tiny house that is your major for the rest of your life. In fact, your major is a compilation of hard and soft skills that are the foundation of a professional skyscraper that you're going to be building over the course of your life with each new job and each new career adding a new floor in their skyscraper. And this generation is going to have, and by that I mean Gen Z, they're going to work in at least four to five different careers, and they'll have on average 17 jobs over the course of their professional life. And so the imposter syndrome is really the amygdala in the brain, that primitive part of the brain that is saying, ooh, I'm learning something new. Danger, danger, right? This is not familiar to me. And I try to get them comfortable with that, with being uncomfortable and recognize that that means that they are going to be learning. They are going to be learning new skills and, and basically expanding their toolkit. And that that is the way that they are going to advance in their career. There's a wonderful study, Dr. Gundry, a report 
that was done in 2019, just before the pandemic, by PwC, the accounting firm, the consultancy, in which they put this survey to 1,300 CEOs at 75 large companies around the world. And it's an annual survey. And they said, in effect, what's keeping you up at night? And their number two answer was that they weren't going to find a workforce that would be adaptable, that would be open to learning and growing, and that they are more concerned about adaptability than they are on the hard skills that those employees would come into their firm learning because they can teach you the skills. You have to have the right mindset, the ability to pivot even in your job, the ability to keep learning, whether it's to upskill or to reskill. Because due to all of the rapid changes in this technological society that we're living in today, you have to be able to learn and relearn and just constantly in order to thrive. You know, it, it sounds like so, so often, particularly in, in colleges, we're, we're being taught to, to this age, today hard skills. And I think what, what you're saying, and I agree with you, is it's probably far more important that we should be teaching anybody how to learn. And, it's the ability to learn that is actually what's so useful in, in, in whatever we decide to do. Absolutely. And I actually have jotted down here some notes because I found this piece fascinating. And I actually, I got it from this terrific book that I'm going to tell your listeners about. It's called Let Go, Learn Fast and Thrive in the Future of Work. The Adaptation Advantage. And in this book, they talk about, you would expect, right? This is probably our listeners will not be surprised to hear, oh, if you study pre-law or if you go to law school, right? You're guaranteed a good job. And the average salary for somebody who goes into the law, whether becoming a judge or a lawyer, is about $94,000. Well, guess what major has a better chance of earning $54,000 more? I give up. Venture a guest, you give up? Yep. The linguist. Huh. Because he's learned, he's learned how to learn. <laughs> Learned how to learn, learned about working through different cultures, learned how to empathize with different cultures. Your The other majors that are your chances of getting a higher salary, a history major, civilization and ethnic studies. So why is that? because they're learning critical thinking, pattern recognition. This world that we are living in right now requires people who know how to communicate, whether through email, whether verbally, even scientists. And I think you and I talked about this in our interview. A re what good is someone's research? It can be the best research out there. If they can't get other people in their field to read it, <laughs> if they can't communicate why that research is so compelling, it's almost like if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, did it fall? No, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, when I was uh, teaching residents in research, um, we would have to we'd have to write an abstract of our findings and that would go before various committees of various organizations for presentation at a national meeting 
and it was you know, very evident, uh, luckily from early on, that it was literally how you wrote that abstract that would you know, entice the committee into really wanting to learn more about your finding. And your finding may be actually very, not very important, but the way you wrote that little come on, if you will, made all the difference in the world of whether somebody was gonna put that on you know, a program for a national or international meeting. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's the ability to communicate your ideas that eventually was the most important part of that paper. Absolutely. And so adaptation and the ability to communicate and learn quickly and to have empathy for whether it's your customer, your colleague, your employer, all of these soft skills are hugely important in the workplace of the 21st century. Okay, so let's, let's pivot and go to the workplace now. And certainly, as there have been a lot of changes in the last almost two years now, what is, tell me about professional pivoting, because that's what's happening almost on a daily basis. What does professional pivoting mean? You and I know what it means because we've both done that. But talk me through it. What, what is professional pivoting? Pivoting. Sure. So when my dad was coming up in the world, he expected to stay in the same profession. And in fact, he has. He's been a journalist for over 50 years. And his father was an entrepreneur and he stayed an entrepreneur his whole life. There are so many people, I'm guessing many of your listeners, who were company men or women, you stayed with the same firm. Today, the world is changing so quickly, and the idea that you would have lifetime employment with one company is no longer a guarantee. It just isn't. And so you may well find yourself moving into not just another job, but another industry. And it's true whether you're a 20-something college grad or whether you're a 40-something mid-career professional, you have transferable skills. And one of the things that I do with the young people that I coach is I have them write down what all their hard and soft skills are, and I recommend this to older listeners as well. I also recommend they check out Dr. Howard Gardner, who is a Harvard University developmental psychologist, who 40 years ago said, the idea of the IQ test as being the sole definition of a person's intelligence is just too narrow. It's not true. And he developed the theory of eight intelligences. I call them our superpowers. These are things that come naturally to us, whether it's dance, whether it's the arts, whether it's communication, whether it's interpersonal or intrapersonal skills. So Write down your hard and soft skills, identify your superpowers, and then see how those align with different job functions, whether it's finance, technical, project management, communications, marketing, on and on. Then write down your interests. Where do you spend your free time? For college students, whether it's extracurriculars or clubs or volunteer work, the same thing for our older listeners, the hobbies that you have, the volunteer work that you have, the side hustles that you may have, those interests align with a gazillion different industries. So stop thinking of yourself if you've been in the world of marketing 
for the last 20 years or the last 30 years as only being a marketer. If you've only done sales, all of those skills are cross-cutting into industries that align with your interests. So what it requires is you to develop a narrative, a story about how your passion, your interests, has led you into this new industry, but how your skills, hard, soft skills, and those superpowers provide you with the experience to do those jobs in those different industries. So uh, should we be practicing these side hustles, even in a job that we, we like and we say, oh, you know, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I can't imagine I'm going to do something else. Uh, is, is that something we should practice, particularly in this day and age when <laughs> things change <laughs> dramatically? Yes, I would say absolutely, especially if you want to earn a little extra money. I mean, who doesn't need a little whatever if it's for retirement, whether it's for vacations, whether it's for splurge money, going out to dinner, things like that. And it's an insurance policy, isn't it? Yeah. Because you are doing something presumably that you really enjoy. You're building expertise in that area. And should you, God forbid, lose your job or your company puts you on furlough, or you just decide, you know what? I don't want to do the nine to five anymore. I want more freedom to do what I want when I want. You've been building up your side hustle. And there are so many people who are going all in in their side hustles. And I think it's a fantastic way for you to spend your free time and to do something that kind of gives you that just in case insurance policy. So is disliking your boss or coworkers a good enough reason to quit your job uh, and try something else, particularly in this day and age? I would say absolutely. I mean, you don't even have to dislike your boss or be in a toxic work environment to say, I want to quit. I would highly recommend, however, that you find that next job if it isn't going to be your side hustle before you quit, because one of those age old expressions that it's easier to find a job when you have, have a, job, a job. Yeah. To begin with is still true. There is a psychological component to it. I would say even just from the negotiating standpoint, they don't think you're desperate. They don't think that you're, you need that job that you're actually exploring your options or whatever you want to say when you're talking to prospective employers. Where does luck fall into this? Uh, in listening to your story, there would be what you might call an element of luck, that there's this person who just happens to be looking for someone who speaks Mandarin Chinese, and you just happen to you know, meet this person. Uh, is there such a thing as luck in all of this? Oh. Dr. Gundry, I am so thrilled that you asked me that question. I don't call it luck. I call it magic. And I've developed a framework that I use with the young people that I coach, and it's the, the 6M framework. And one of the M's is magic. Sometimes it's black magic, the pandemic is an example of that. Or you could say small m black magic when I had my opportunity with the Peace Corps go sideways. But at other times, it's fairy dust magic. You could call it serendipity. You could call it luck. But I have seen this happen over and over again. And I'm 
thinking about the story that you told me about when you and your wife were at that conference and you happened to run into that young guy who said, hey, Dr. Gundry, have you ever thought about making supplements? And you thought, oh boy, here we go again, right? You're right. What are the chances that you would need? So the truth is, we have the opportunity at all different stages of our life to have these magical encounters. You will be in a job that you may not like, but your colleague is doing something that you, wow, that really looks interesting. And you discover a whole different type of job that really lights you up. You could be standing online at the grocery store and you strike up a conversation with somebody next to you and they start talking about, oh, the company that they work at and you learn that, oh, there's an industry that you'd never heard of before that somehow or another really interests you and that person says, well, give me a call. I'll be happy to introduce you to people here. So put yourself out there. Experience life. And I recognize even in the pandemic, so much is still virtual, but you can have conversations with friends. You can network on LinkedIn and meet new people that will lead you to these magical experiences that will uncover different jobs, different careers that will truly light you up. Yeah, I was uh, last night, uh, I was at a, a John Legend concert in Santa Barbara. And, oh, lucky you. Yeah, and uh, he actually spent about 20 minutes on stage alone at his piano talking about his life. And one of the fascinating parts of his story, I won't go into the whole thing, but he uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania and went into a business career. Uh, which that's why you go to that school. And he had a musical talent. And he, you know, he says, you know, I was doing Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations, and you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. But I was always kind of fiddling with music and writing music. And my roommate said, hey, I'm going to Chicago. Um, we're going to go into a recording studio and Ariana Grande is going to be recording. Why don't you come with me? We'll have a good time. So he's in the studio and they're kind of kicking around between these uh, uh, tracks that she's recording and they get to talking and he says, well, you know, I play piano. And she says, oh, really? She says, well, let me hear you play. So they drag him out into the recording studio and he starts playing. She says, you know, you're good. Uh, why don't you play piano on this next track? And it, track 13, as he said. So he's playing piano on track 13, and who would be walking into the studio but Kanye West? And, and he says, I'll leave it there. But he said, now you're going to say, okay, you know, Kanye West, he supports me, blah, 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 and Ariana Grande. He said, I was turned down by so many record labels, I can't tell you. But he said, I currently work for the record label that turned me down you know, twice before. And the point of all this was, here's this magic, here's this, uh, my daughter calls it God's wink, uh, whatever we want to call it. Um, but you know, if he hadn't been there, he wouldn't be here. But I think the other part of that was, it was perseverance once he got that new option that people don't hear about the story. You know, they, they don't hear the hard work that went into, oh, you've always been famous. Well, no, you know, he was a working stiff in business. And yes, did he have a great break? Yes, but that great break took years and years and years and years to finally become his career, which he loves. But it's, it's, you hear this story all the time. 
I love that story. And if I can tie it back to where we began and the fact that after I took that job in China, after that magical encounter with a friend of my parents, and I went there and all of my friends outside of work were journalists. And I mentioned how I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. What I didn't realize until then was that your extracurricular activities, your hobbies, where you spend your free time, what lights you up and fills you with energy and gets you into flow are the breadcrumbs that you should follow to find your passion. And when I had been an undergrad at Middlebury College, I had been involved in the college radio station. And my senior year, I was the news director of the radio station. But I just thought that's what you did for fun. I didn't realize that it were that that was a big clue, that that was something that I might do for my profession. So be open to the the universe. I know that sounds maybe a little airy fairy, but the positive energy that you put out and I am a huge fan of Carol Dweck and her book Mindset and having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset as well as Angela Duckworth's book Grit, which is to your point Dr. Gundry the power of passion and perseverance. You can identify what lights you up, but it is going to take a lot of hard work and perseverance to achieve what you want to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, people talk about, oh, he's a natural born athlete or a natural born tennis player. And I used to take my resume, I said, there's no such thing as a natural born surgeon. It's someone who has worked for 10 years learning the skill set and then learning it so well and applying it so well that when someone walks into the operating room and watches you work, they go, wow, you know, that person is a natural born surgeon. And no, um, yes, <laughs> you got to have a passion to do it, but it's the hard work that... Uh, really makes the difference in the end. And actually, even those great athletes like a Kobe Bryant, you heard about his legendary work ethic. Exactly, exactly. Even the greats, whether you're a surgeon or a sports person, they are putting in hours of hard work to achieve their success. All right. Uh, I'm gonna, actually, I, uh, I'm going to wrap it up, but I got to tell you a story about my wife, which uh, is relates to this. Uh, my wife has had multiple jobs uh, in her lifetime, from a Pan Am flight attendant to a multi-million dollar real estate agent. And when she turned 50, uh, she had bought a handbag in New York City uh, that was made out of raffita, and it was circular. And we were walking down the strip in Las Vegas 20 odd years ago and people would stop her on the street and said oh my gosh where'd you get that handbag I've never seen anything like it I mean literally people would stop her and she came home and she said you know I wonder if there's a business in selling this handbag and I said she said you know this is very interesting so we found the designer we actually met him in New York City in a, his name was Doc Kim, and we signed a contract in a McDonald's on 57th <laughs> Street and Avenue of the Americas, seriously, with him. And my wife uh, was also an interior designer, so she designed a very small store in Palm Desert and called it Zents. And handbags and accessories, she's now had the store for over 20 years, totally pivoted from being, you know, a real estate agent to follow, and she was just on the fact that people would stop her on the street and said, "Where? Do, uh, look at that handbag! I've never seen anything like it." And you know, morphed into a business that she loves that she's been doing for twenty years, and she started when she was age fifty. Ah, oh, 
<laughs> I love that. And Dr. Gundry, if I can bring it back to what you do for a living, I would like to advise our listeners and our viewers to get out of their heads and into their heart and their gut. Because if they're listening to your podcast, they know that the gut, <laughs> especially a healthy gut, is known as the second brain. Listen to your gut. Listen to your heart. Recognize that we're all afraid. Lean into your strengths and follow your heart and your gut. And you will have a fulfilling and exciting professional journey. So well said, and I happen to think the gut is actually the first brain that controls this silly little piece of fat up here, but we can get into that next time. And I think that's what's so exciting, particularly in women, and I have two daughters and three female dogs and a wife, um, and you guys are so empowered because you really do have gut feelings. and. We need to encourage everyone listening, but particularly our, our female listeners, to trust that gut instinct. I mean, it's real. And you need, females need to embrace that ability that sadly uh, many males don't seem to be connected with their gut as well. So well said. All right, I got to let you go. How do people find you? Um, tell us about what you're up to, and we'll go from there. Sure. Well, they can find me on LinkedIn, Andrea Koppel. Follow me, reach out and connect with me. And if you have any young people, whether they be college students or young professionals who are stuck overwhelmed, don't know what they want to do, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, or you can go to my website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and you can see for career coaching, there's a tab, click on that, and you can set up a free 30-minute consultation with me. Wow, for free? For free. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gosh, all right, don't, don't flood the phone lines and the internet, folks. But <laughs> thank you for doing that. Uh, that's really exciting news, particularly in this day and age. And, You're very welcome. And good luck with all of this, and uh, hopefully we'll be talking in the near future. And you can, uh, you can tell me about how many people you've given the free consult to. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, great seeing you again. Take care. All right, it's time for our audience question. This review comes from uh, uh, Zeta K on YouTube. What about broccoli sprouts, Dr. Gundry? Can I eat them? Well, not only can you eat them, but they may be one of the greatest health foods of all time. In fact, there are compounds in broccoli sprouts that have actually been patented by Johns Hopkins University. Um, they are sulfur-containing compounds, sulforaphane, and these compounds have the ability to stop cancer cell growth in their tracks. They're some of the best ways to make probably the most important antioxidant called glutathione. And so there are now broccoli sprout capsules, but Get yourself some broccoli sprouts, sprinkle them on your salads. You can even cook with them, put them in your pasta. Broccoli sprouts, if you're going to eat sprouts, that's the one to look for. They're really, really good for you. So thank you for bringing that up. Time for the review of the week. This review comes from Free Mandela on YouTube. For four days now, I've applied a lectin-free diet. Thanks to you, Dr. Gundry. I can already see and feel many benefits. No more pain during digestion, normal transit, better breathing. Thank you very much for all that content that you share so generously with the world. Well, Free Mandela, what a great handle. 
Uh, thanks very much. It's exciting to hear that this is what's happening for you. And your experience is so true of so many thousands of people who write back and say, gee, you know, I didn't, fee I didn't know in a way how bad I was feeling until I started feeling good and remembering what good actually felt like. And so thanks very much for that review. And remember, please, if you like what you hear or see on the Dr. Gundry podcast, write us a review wherever you get your podcast, particularly on iTunes. And I'd be happy to read your uh, review on the air. And this is what keeps me going every week, week in, week out. So thanks a lot. And you know why I do this, because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. See you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.